Probably. Good evening. Professor Obama made an astonishing motion the other day. One that is almost unrecognizable in contemporary political parlance. <clears throat> These things are true, he said, not maybe true, not sometimes true, not true this week, not true is a relative true, not you have your true and I have mine. Then he listed the ingredients of the true qualities essential to any successful human endeavor. Strength, courage, endurance, mixed with a willingness to imagine the world as other than it is, and as a consequence, revise its direction. Let's call this premise, or I'll call this premise, the OD, the OD, the Obama Doctrine. Is it a liberal's list of conservative virtues or a conservative list of liberal virtues? Obama's allegiances are intentionally ambiguous, and that's where the art of the OD lies. The contemporary cliche is everything changes and the, the calculus of change moves faster and faster. How often have we heard that line repeated, but is it so? Or does that conventional change postulate omit the durability postulate that Obama included in his equation? Sayark would like to second the Obama motion. Innovation and experiment, risk and courage endure, while we re-examine the game, change the rules, and alter the discourse. Sayark is an OD signatory. We're coming to you in a minute. <laughs> Sayark began its architecture adventure 30 or so years ago without a board of directors. Predictably, a state agency mandated a board, and that board was for many years a collection of supporters, mostly drawn from a group of collegial and local architects. And that happenstance board continued to ratify the confident self-image of a school whose vision was largely introverted. Architect to architect, student to student, academy to academy. Cyark's friend confirmed its world, while Cyark's designated enemies inhabited a world with priorities Sayark largely shunned. Sayark claimed virtue, but that virtue, if that's what it was, inhibited the school's in engagement with the aggressive and diverse group that has had so much to say about the built world going up around us all. In the last six years, the conception of Sayark in the world has radically changed. The Board of Architect Colleagues is gone, and a new group of professionals has joined us. SciArc now acknowledges the need to collaborate in a discourse with those political, social, economic, and artistic worlds that once found us as we found them, conceptual non-sequiturs. Enter Mr. Nazarian. Sam Nazarian, the new LA entrepreneur. Sam joined the SciArc board last year, and together with Kevin Ratner, Jerry Newman, John Gerisi, Tom Gilmore, Mary Norris, Dan Schwartz, and others, SciArc's board now represents a coalition of talented actors who are altering the operational pro forma of the city and the reasons for being of the city's design. Sam Nazarian shoulders a unique portfolio. His cartage is ideas, confidence, energy, momentum. It's not so bad. 
<laughs> and, and the overwhelming sensibility, he's having a hell of a lot of fun. Hotels, clubs, adventures in food, adventures in entertainment, a continually re revised conception of the business of life in the city and the role of architecture in the business of the city's reconception. Sam Nazarians is an important new voice for SciArc, a voice the SciArc community needs to hear. An urban developer, a new category of architecture consumer, a revised conception of the interrelationship of design and commerce, and an obvious progenitor of the OD. Please welcome Sam Nazarian and his colleague and his colleague Teresa Fatino to Siam. <laughs>
facilities, um, end of the day, you want to get them built. And that's what I want to speak about. And that's ultimately, as a developer who's acquired 22 hotels, who right now we're master planning millions of square feet and working with architects like yourself, or ultimately like yourself, or in many cases like yourself, how does that happen? How does that thought, I call it the eight and a half by 11 piece of paper, the cartoon, which I see a lot of great cartoons coming down and up and down these halls. How does that translate to a final product that you can stand in front of one day and say, I helped, I designed and helped build this and it's because of me that this happened or I had a piece of it. And I think that's ultimately what as developers and builders and creators, if you will, that's what we want. That's what's the ultimate vision. And when I started in this business 15 years ago, maybe less, I'm 33, so I did the math, I was an 18, maybe 12, it sounds better, 15. I'm Persian, I can exaggerate too a little bit. It's <laughs> California state law, I, we get about 10% exaggeration about it. <laughs> so it's like, that's true, I did that the California Supreme Court now. Um, but how do you guys get your vision and work with developers like myself branding and marketing and conceptualized facets of what Teresa does, and I'll share with you in a second what Teresa does, and how do you finish a project? What are the things you need to be thinking of as you're creating these amazing avant-garde for you know, cutting edge buildings or mixed use projects or residential projects or retail stores? Ultimately, you guys will need to find a place somewhere when you leave here. Uh, whether it's at a big firm or a boutique firm or with a developer, the way the economy is going, hopefully somewhere. Um, and I just wanted to share with you some insight. Um, you know, um, the real this is real time stuff. I mean, before I got here today, I'll give you a snapshot of my day. I had uh, Tony Marnell, for uh, who's the owner of Marnell Correo Architects, General Contractors, who personally has built every major casino in Las Vegas, you know, Wynn, Bellagio, Rio. New York, New York, so forth and so on, and we're master planning our hotel, which is the Sahara that we own. And with his whole crew of architects, actually one of them is actually here on our team, Steve Roof, who's one of our architects who work with our TKL. And how does that process work? And how does it work in, in our early space? And the other thing we want to talk about is branding and how important that is more. So in the case of a company like MGM Mirage or a company like Related, you guys are knowing we're doing the project here, or even as my way over here, one of the reasons I was late, I was meeting with AEG, who was a very close partner of ours, by the, by the name of Ted Tanner, who's their architect and developer. Everything is now going towards energy, in our, in our belief. The, the lines of architecture, design, interior design, tenant mix, everything you guys are thinking about as far as creating this amazing product is no matter if you're a blue chip developer in Shanghai or if you're a nightclub builder on the Sunset Strip is really, in my opinion, in our opinion, revolving around energy, brand integrity, differentiation, and knowing your product. And I don't know where we are with, with our presentation, yeah. TF. We're ready. We're ready. Can, can we show the video? Yes. Starwood Hotels and Resorts, 
and creating, I don't know how many of you guys have heard, I'm sure all of you have W Hotels. Um, Teresa with Barry Sternlich, who was the owner and founder of Starwood Hotels, who uh, now is the largest hotel company in the country, um, which owns St. Regis, Weston, Sheraton, Luxury Collection. Um, set forth seven years ago, actually no, seven years, you were with them for seven years, so 11 years ago, mandated to build a brand called W, which happened to be Mr. Sterling's wife's favorite magazine. That's why it's called W. True, and also what was interesting about that is um, I got introduced into the hospitality industry by fluke because she also loved Pottery Barn. And so what he, when he was looking at the business and thought, why is it that we have all these hotels that are so expensive but they don't look good? Um, why do we have ugly, spongy, polyester bedspreads and padded ice buckets? And, and how is it that Pottery Barn can, can bring good design to the masses, yet I'm paying a fortune for design that is, is it's worse than hideous? So that was a marriage. Um, I'm, I'm not, uh, I didn't study, um, I had studied architecture very briefly. I ran running after, I think, my first semester, so my hat's off to all of you here. Um, but I'm a product developer and product designer by nature, so the approach, and I think the, the, what we brought to W in that brand was that it was a new approach to um, an, an industry that was tired and it needed a new fresh voice and a new set of eyes and a new perspective. So um, that's you know what I brought to the table there. And then now um, with SBE, I uh, oversee all the um, creative um, design and touch points of PR and marketing and working with development and operations to make sure that whatever product we produce is um, useful, it is memorable, it has a lasting impression, and um, that it works. Sometimes that happens, sometimes it doesn't, but it's the beauty in making mistakes. Hopefully we don't make too many mistakes, but um, there's great things that can come from making mistakes because you discover new things, very much like we did with W. So, um, so Sam, what I, um, basically the, the net net of the, this um, presentation or talk, if you will, is to give a snapshot of our, our restaurants and nightlife group, and then really take a look at SLS as a case study of how we apply that thought process. And well, you know, my experience and Sam's experience has varied. What I did at Pottery Barn and Ralph Lauren uh, W was at all of those companies, the common goal was to engage the customer and create a lasting, memorable, hopefully meaningful um, experience and um, to fulfill a promise. So, um, so anyway, let's um, let's let's do wanna, let's go through the um, let's go through the restaurant night like we can start with fourteen. And, um, well, I, mean, I, I think one of the things that I think is I think is interesting is talking about the, the, the conceptual basis of why we started SBE and what is SBE in our mind and what does it hope to be and what has it become. Just a function of the brands we've created and how does that parlay into. That's what's relevant to you um, as architects. Um, and you know, it's funny because the more and more I sit with architects, the more architectural firms we, we, we um, interview, the more time that we, the more mature we can become as a company. Um, architecture is crucial, but really the thought behind, because at the end of the day, what we do, and I was told today, don't, don't be the architect. Told that about 50 times today from our lead architect. Stop being the architect. Stop being the architect. It's master planning. It's putting these circles. It's picking the. I mean, outside of the mathematics of architecture, of load and, and the technical side of, of building these high rises, as, as we're proposing to build a 60-story high rise in Vegas. Believe it or not, today, um, it's the interaction of what we believed in LA six years ago, seven years ago, when we helped fund and support the Viceroy brands or a company called Core, which has actually now moved to downtown. And it's looking at LA as really the opportunity for us to brand and expand all of our brands and really rule out all of our brands. What does that mean? And what does building a cool nightclub mean? Why are our clubs cool? Why are some other clubs not cool? And some of that intangible stuff um, and, and staying cool from a nightclub, you guys all go, you guys all go to bars and nightclubs, and I presume you do, I hope you do. 
And you know, it's, it's energy, it's flow. Um, there's a reason why certain nightclubs are better than others. There's reasons why certain restaurants are better than others. And all that is the same indication back to layout and ultimately architecture. And five years ago when I started, or now it's more, six years ago when I started SBE, and I saw, and I had seen the, 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 I think the rollout of W and Ian Shrink, you know, and Andre Balaj and all these people in the hotel space, I started realizing that food and beverage, architecture, interior design, service, everything kind of blended in this three-dimensional three paradigm, this three-dimensional force that, you know, that all of them had to speak to each other. And why nightclub operators, in the case of Ian Schrager and potentially myself, and a lot of other people, why they became such good hotel operators and such good people as far as laying out three to five million square foot venues as we're doing now, was all about flow. So one of the things that we do on a consistent basis, and I think some of our architects here who work with us at SP can probably attest to, is the majority of my time when I sit at these meetings and these design meetings is explaining to the architects and the general contractors and the operational people who are involved in so many facets of them, is put yourself in the mind of the end user. And also put your mind in, in the sense of when a person walks into your property, how does this person use your property? How, does they, how do they flow? What do they see? What are the lines of sight? What are the things that are important to them? Why are they on your property? And I call it valet to valet. So from the time they drug and dropped off to the time they get picked up. And moving on to the properties that we have, like 14, which, are, which is our new, I think our, our most beautiful restaurant that we built on Sunset, which was the old shelter nightclub, the village nightclub, Foxtail that we did, uh, which is... Now, six years ago when we started, there really wasn't any nice nightclubs or really nice restaurants aesthetically. You know, when I partnered with Philippe Stark um, six years ago, actually this was our first contract, and then we did a contract in South Beach, Florida, which is our hotel that's under construction there. Um, and about a year and a half ago, we signed him to a 15-year contract in North America. So basically for 15 years, if he's alive, God willing, at this pace, we don't know with all the champagne he drinks. But, um, um, is, you know, I mean, here's a guy who's not an architect, He's an interior designer, he's a thinker, he's a product designer, he's a furniture designer, he designs swatches, he designs stuff for Target. Um, but the thing that he knows very well is flow off the blueprints, is, is, is how these blueprints that, that we look at in a, in a very linear way pop out, and how this person is walking through, and what do they see, and what are the ways with smoke and mirrors, or in very expensive finishes, uh, you can really export this person or take this person through a journey that you guys have depicted. And that's what we've done, and that's what we try to do, and that's why we've been successful, I think. And again, we have made mistakes, and probably more mistakes than we'd like to remember. Um, and when you bring people like Teresa on board, who wasn't a very easy task in itself, but you know, when someone like Teresa at that point creates a relationship between architects, the general contractor, the designers, the purchasing agents, the operating supply and equipment people, you start seeing that as an architect, you're a very important facet, but a facet of the building process. Because after adhering to budgets, entitlement issues, economic swings, and so forth and so on, you are, you know, you start realizing that sometimes things are outside of your control and you're really trusting the developer and the owner to be able to build a product that you've envisioned. Vice versa, Philippe Stark trusts me in building his product and vice versa, I trust him in him designing and conceptualizing something that will ultimately work. You know, in the case of Foxtail, what we did, uh, it, was, it was a test with a uh, designer named Frank Magiano, who was part of the, the Viceroy and the, and the Kelly Worsler phase of interior design. And actually worked with Kelly for 11 years, and you know we decided to go with a very interesting Art Deco interior and exterior. And again, it's, I think what Eric said as far as being bold and taking risks, but you know 
uh, Art Deco really, in the, in the sense of West Hollywood or Beverly Hills, or that's, that strip really did not have any source, uh, sort of presence in, a, in, a, in this kind of setting. Um, and the, the introduction of audiovisual and the introduction of, of, of space planning and layout and bottle service and all the fun stuff that you see really was very subtle. You know, it was all a case of millwork, and it was all a case of built-in cushioning and built-in seating and so forth and so on. But ultimately, right now, when you look at Foxdale, the flow, I don't know if you guys have been there, but the flow is, is pretty unique. And the fact that when people leave one of our venues, they know by stamp that it is an SBE venue. So the brand integrity within our, project, within our projects are pretty clear, I guess I say pretty linear, um, that you know you've left an SBE product. The more and more we do of them, the more and more prevalent they are. Um, in the case of Espar, which was a place that we did at Hollywood and Vine, here was a building called the Broadway, which we actually helped develop with Core, which turned into 96 condos, rooftop pool. It was an old 1930s building, one of the most unique part of, and one of the most decrepit part of the Hollywood Boulevard, Hollywood and Vine, very, very, very famous corner. We had a 1,200 square foot space with 25 foot ceilings with a, with a column off center. Um, no mechanical, no mat, no bathroom. It was pretty much a corn shell, very similar to this where we're sitting right now. And with Philippe, we came up with, I can't turn around and look because then I can't talk. But what we ended up coming was, what we ended up coming up conceptually was a very, Versailles-esque, using audiovisual, using images, um, which in many ways is what a lot of designers are doing now. They're exporting you with images. Um, whether you know whether you go, you start going to different nightclubs in Vegas or different nightclubs uh, or bars and so forth and so on. Images are, are one of the best uses of this of design because in six months, if you don't like them, you can tear them down and put up new images, and they only cost you what they cost you. Um, but more importantly, it gave a really unique opportunity in Hollywood that it was a local bar, it was a local's bar, it was a bar for a very sophisticated part of a uh, clientele that really in Hollywood would, would only have to go to the kind of Walter Mall nightclubs and the way. So that's really how we differentiated that brand. And then we coupled it right next door to our Katsuya Hollywood brand, which both of these won international design awards, actually S Bar won two. And, and Katsuya Hollywood won Travel and Leisure Best Design Restaurant in 2000, uh, 2007. Um, and again, these were really, really tough spaces to lay out. Architecturally, interior-wise, we had entrances off of Vine. We had, and ultimately, if you do get a chance to walk them, and here we are turning a second location, Katsuya, which in the restaurant world, when you win an award, it's usually the first one that gets it. And the, the way in which they've all integrated with each other, and the street presence that they had, and the way they integrated with the residential lobby, the residences, which in the case of SBAR, not so well from the noise factor, and then with the rooftop pool, and so forth and so on, now you start seeing a massive. Now you start seeing how these layers all work together. You know, we have a pink berry next to us, and so forth and so on, but from a, from a massive standpoint, you have to keep in mind, and again, this is some, what some, some of the architects in our project did not do very well, but sound is sound mitigation, is the way in which when two, at 2 a.m. when people are leaving our bars, they're making noise to our, to, actually it's a very interesting case study, that one as far as noise, because we had double, double insulated the glass of all the residences who lived above us. And the residences who didn't have double insulated glass or left their windows open would, would actually hear less noise because the double insulated glass, because the building was an old building and, and these, the, the noise would penetrate through these concrete columns that went up into these, into these condos. The people that actually closed their windows would actually hear it. It became this vacuum of sound where the people that actually opened their windows would just hear car music and car sound. Um, and that's a place where, as, as, re, as um, People who, who will get into the condo development business, nine out of 10 times you're gonna get sued. That's what happened here. We, we actually worked it out with our tenants. Um, but SBAR being very lofty, again, these were very ambitious designs. Everything we do is very ambitious from a design standpoint. 
um, and it's you know it's been very very successful. Um, Katsuya, and I'll just start working with our, one of our last restaurant uh, brands, Katsuya, which we started in Brentwood, uh, which was not a place that really most people expected us to open our Japanese restaurant with Chef Katsuya, who's a very famous chef from the valley. And ultimately now we're on our fourth Katsuya, um, which opens up at LA Live here um, in April or May. And this is a brand, from an integrity standpoint, you can do a case study from its inception. Um, the Katsuya, the first one in Brentwood, was in an office building with 30 foot of frontage, 7,000 square feet, everything that you would possibly hope for that could go wrong. I mean, as from a layout perspective, was. And, you know, coming back in and squaring the boxes and squaring the layouts and giving people, um, you know, LA is a very unique city. It's not like New York or Chicago or Miami, or maybe closer to Miami than anything else, but you know, there's, there's an existence of people want to be seen and they want other people to see them. And we all know the story about LA. Um, you know, TMZ started outside of our doors at, at Hyde when we opened Hyde three years ago. And the biggest thing about TMZ was showing people who couldn't get into Hyde. It's almost like watching a train wreck. Um, which is funny, and now TMZ has its own, you know, I mean, literally it's become, you know, an actual, you know, a, a word that my mother knows what TMZ means, which is pretty scary. Um, so th there have been a lot of operators, the point I bring this up is there have been a lot of operators who come to LA, some of the best chefs in the world, some of the best hoteliers in the world, some of the best builders. And if they don't get their, in this particular case, LA, if they're on the wrong street, if they're on the wrong corner, if they don't have outdoor seating, if they don't have valet parking, if they design the spaces that are too dark. There's a lot of examples of, I'm sure you guys know where people can't show off, people can't see each other. In the sense of nightlife at restaurants, you're probably, probably not going to do well. If you look at the staple restaurants we've had in LA for many years, Mr. Chow's, Spago, Ivy, Ago, Giorgio Baldi, Dantana's, Mandeo's, these are just the ones that have been staples for many years. Think about it. I mean, when you, there's no private dining rooms. Everybody sees everybody. As soon as everybody walks in the room, everybody knows they're there. Everybody knows who's spending, who's sitting with who, the agents, the talent agents, whether you're with William Morris, CAA, ICM, whether you're with DreamWorks, Paramount. It doesn't, it's the sense of, and that's why really food and design wasn't that important. It was a sense of, I'm at Ivy on Saturday, I'm at Ivy at three, uh, 12 o'clock on lunch, I got the right table, I got this. And we have tried to change that, and it's a huge uphill struggle. It's an uphill struggle to bring design in that people appreciate. We, uh, we opened up in October of last year, we brought two James Beard award-winning chefs, two, both Bon Appetit Chef of the Year 2005 and 2006, at the same month, within the same city, about a mile and a half apart from each other. And we introduced LA to a, another level of fine dining, which it really, it's, I don't know if it was ready for or not, it was hugely successful between 14 and the Bazaar. But I mean, that's another thing of really knowing your market, knowing your concept, and knowing the people that you're working with. So if some of you do design, decide to run into the interior business, or the interior design business, or the food and beverage business, um, those are things that you can spend hours and hours and hours and hours talking about. And these are some of the things that I spend a lot of time educating, and some of our operations people spend a lot of time educating our architects in-house, um, and more importantly, our architects that we work with as consultants about energy. Um, I'm going to talk a little here. Um, why don't you talk a little bit to yourself? Okay. All right. I'll talk to you. Um, so. A lot of things that Sam is talking about, um, one of the first things that we always do on a project before we will put pencil to paper is that we'll create a brief. And this brief um, dissects, um, really looks into, before we know what we want to be, we, we take a look at the marketplace and we define a niche in the market, whether it's, it's a sushi restaurant or, or a hotel. But what's very, very critical in this equation of getting all these different personalities, and many of them larger than life, with very distinct um, opinions 
and wanting to inflect their own opinions on a project, how do you corral this great energy into a concise point of view where in the end it doesn't look like a mismatch of, of either a mess or compromise and it looks um, fluid. So, so again, we do create these briefs that we give to everyone and oftentimes we will figure it out, we'll figure out the whole entire project in the case of SLS, I'll go through that, is again, before Philippe drew one line of a, of a drawing, we gave him a brief and we went through, this is our, the personality of our brand. Why do we deserve to exist? Why do we, why have we earned the right to create a new hotel brand when the market is saturated with hotels and different brands? How are we going to do it different? How are we going to make a difference? So we really dissected, um, dissected and, and went back in our thought process and, and, and wiped the strip slate clean, excuse me. Before we got there, and, and this was really Sam and his, his doing of this, is, is he took a look at the marketplace and said, okay, well, where do we want to be? Where, where are the key markets? Then we identified an opportunity in the market in the whole hotel industry where you had these really great hotels. There were five-star, six-star six luxury hotels, so beautiful, designed to the nines, but so boring, you want to kill yourself. Um, you know, beautiful, but you know, you're going to fall asleep and okay, now the next day you're ready to get out of there. So, and then these great three-star hotels that had great design, but you couldn't read, you couldn't see, they had terrible service, um, a business travel had difficulty having all the amenities they had. So we saw this, you know, we created this, this grid of, of exciting and pallid and vibrant and, and, and so, I mean, this is, this is, I think, a job to you. Yeah. This is what I think, this is the huge, probably the biggest thesis of our company, so I'll, I'll, I'll talk about this. I like to call it the white space. Um, and I think you can find that white space that's analogous in any one of your chosen fields, uh, especially if you want to leave an impact or try to leave an impact um, or try to take a chance from that perspective. Um, in the hospitality space, we were a part of and I actually had studied, and I studied personally, the boutique hotel market for over six years. We're actually investors in seven boutique hotels. And what we saw, which kind of stood out with us, and we partnered with a company, which was her former company, Starwood. Um, and we did a case study, and we actually did a, a, a thesis that showed that between W Hotels and St. Regis Hotels, or in the sense of between the, the, the Chateau Marmont and the Four Seasons, there is a huge white space. What does that mean? That means for the last 15, 20 years, there's been a lot of cool hotels, a lot of cool, fun hotels, trendy hotels. Ian Traeger, who was a genius, who started the boutique hotel movement, or one of the founders of the hotel movement, was, he was a genius. He said, I'm gonna build hotels, um, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to buy these amazing properties, which back then, very similar to the climate that we had today, he could pick up the Montreal on Sunset, he picked it up for $7 million, as an example. And I got this great avant-garde French guy, and who I can't speak, I don't understand what he's saying, he doesn't understand what I'm saying, but, which if you talk to Ian and if you talk to Philippe, you understand what I mean. Um, and I'm going to build the hottest nightclub, and bar, and if you want to get into my bar, you got to be staying in the room. Andre Balazs copied that in his own interpretation, and so forth and so on, and that really spurred on the sense of the boutique hotel. And really, what does a boutique hotel mean? Boutique hotel, by its thesis and by, by its definition, means a very, it's a hotel that's one-off, meaning one, you know, there's only one of, or there's you know, very few of, they're, they don't have any amenities, so they don't have any meeting rooms, spa, they don't have spas, gym, you know, they don't have, you know, the kind of conventional hotels you think when you think of a Sheraton or you think of a uh, Hyatt. And they're very design focused. So when Schrager started this revolution and he opened up the Sanderson and he opened up St. Martin's Lane in London and, and the Paramount, his first hotel was the Morgan's actually in New York, Delano, these were all revolutions. These were literally microcosms of revolutions of this is where you needed to be. And he coupled it with his celebrity partners, which we haven't talked about at all here, which is obviously a huge shot of credibility for your 
property and your business. But you know, I mean, he's, he's, in the case of South Beach, Miami, he spread around a rumor that Miami, that Madonna was his partner in the, the Delano. And the Delano was in a part of South Beach at the time, which is a, which is a very, very decrepit part of town at the time, 17th and Collins. And it became the hottest hotel in the country. And he did it with 5% of the money that I think going back to Teresa's point that a Ritz Carlton did or you know, or, or you know, any of these major hotels did. Subsequently, as any good idea, people comp people copy him. And as this, this as this repetitive process happened, as everybody came up with new hotel brands that fit this space, which in our, in the particular case are, are, are vibrant and three star. We realized, and especially because Teresa was a part of that, and that's what W was. What W did is W said, W Hotels, to correct me if I'm wrong, Teresa, but you guys said, we're going to create nice looking, cool hotels, but they're not going to be that cool. They're going to be cool enough. But the light switches are going to work, your internet access is going to work, you're going to have room service that you'll at least get. Well, the food will be good, it'll be pretty good. But you'll be a part of Starwood Preferred uh, Rewards Program, and if you use your credit card with American Express, your miles will work. And it became part of an infrastructure and a pipeline. And that's why W now is probably the most successful hotel chain in the history of hotels, uh, probably up to four to four seasons in Rosewood. Now, what our thesis was five years ago, and we didn't, we didn't design the brand to fit a particular building. We designed the brand before we even owned a hotel. And that, to me, was crucial is we, we found what we believed was the white space. That the consumer that was tired of the boutique hotel, that had grown out of the boutique hotel, did not want to walk through a nightclub to get to his or her room, wanted to have a spa, wanted to have a place to take his wife or her husband, wanted a place to have a meeting, but didn't want to go to the Four Seasons, the Peninsula, the Ritz Carlton. So our main mantra before we even started this was, you know, not your father's Four Seasons. And the beauty of that, a place you can have a wedding, a place you can have your father's 60th birthday, a place you can go with friends, a place you can take a date, a place you can take your kids. Um, but with all the kind of the goods, the good sides of both sides of design, accountability, and service. So, sorry to cut you off. No, but um, to your point, is everything Sam is saying, he's, he's verbalizing it. So, but when you get in front of an investor or someone or a designer who you want to buy into your vision, and to come on board with you, you know, a lot of this and this doesn't, you know, how do you put that in paper and how do you describe it to multi people? So, again, what you're seeing. Sorry, is, no, but you know what I mean. Sick. So, you talk, but you have to. But you have to. I mean, everything he's saying is he said it. He said it. He said it five years ago. So, then you know, the challenge was how do you put that in front of Joe Banker and Joe Investor? So, you know, this is the process that we went through. And we also, you know, in front of Joe Fest Investor, and, and for Sam himself, before he invests all this time and money and effort into building this, we also took a look at our competitive market analysis because we looked at our market in LA. This is, we knew that we were gonna have a hotel here. And if the space was filled, then we had to, we, knew, we had to do our homework. Um, and so this is, again, just as a snapshot of one page of what we did, but we looked at everything from meeting space um, amenities, uh, spa size, everything. In addition to that, we also looked at um, operational standard comparison. And again, we took these happened to be all Starwood hotels because they were going. We knew that they were going to manage our properties, but we knew that we wanted to at least match their best um, their best brands, which was a luxury collection in the same reach as they were redefining. So again, we went through pages and pages and pages. It's everything from wake up calls to if you have an umbrella in the closet. So again, we did our research before anything was done in the design. Now another thing we did is we created this manifesto. And the manifesto was given to all disciplines, operations, development, design, our culinary teams. And what this manifesto was, was to define the essence and the personality of our brand. And this, this um, presentation, what you're about to see, was the driving force, and this was our mantra of everything that we spoke to and spoke to us. So then the questions go as, as this, who am I really? What makes me, me? And if you look at this, what makes me, me? What defines me? Travel defines me, family, a relationship, caring for the environment, all of these things 
make up our, our thinking patterns and our decisions. Doesn't seem like there's a lot of pressure in the world. Curiosity is the mother of intelligence, they say. It's a surprise name. Spark ideas. Make me feel. Challenge me and make me think. I want to be surrounded by intelligence. Set me free. Don't pin me down. I'm constantly evolving, so why can't my space? Why do I have to be defined by the space that I'm in? I want to contribute, but let me decide how. I want to share ideas, share music, and be thoughtful. Oops, wait a minute, that's not it. What I love about this, actually, this is it. You see how the face, the, it's actually the face of the person. And the quote is, no man is an island entire of itself. Every man is a piece of the continent and a part of the main. And what this represents to us is what Sam was referring to as creating this sense of legacy. And we want our guests to help us define what this brand is and what this experience is. So they're going to be a part of us, and we want to be a part of them in a very thoughtful way. Let's be thoughtful. Why give socks in, in twos? Why not threes in case you, you lose one? A little gesture goes a long way. A tip of the hat, a thank you, a complimentary dessert. Um, being nice. Being nice and uh, kindness. Being, being nice is free. And that's one thing that we, uh, if you ever go to any of our properties, from, from a perspective of operations, and from a perspective, probably the cheapest thing you can do is train your staff. It's just being nice, smiling. Things will go wrong every day. Things go wrong. We have close to what, 3,000 employees. We have 12, 13 operating venues. We have a 1,700 casino we're managing in Vegas. We own. Things will go wrong. Just smile. Say sorry. Let me make it up to you. It's free. So, exactly. And actually, this is one of the driving forces of it. Kindness costs nothing, but it's worth a fortune. Surround me with beauty, even in the most unlikely of places. And what if the more you look, the more you found? Can you read that? It says opulent in the fuzzy. No detail is too small, like this grain of, of rice with the, the S painted on it. The details are what makes the difference, whether it's quality, thoughtfulness, and remembering what the guests want, and remembering before they do also coming up with a need before they know they need it. Elegance is timeless and ageless. The even ordinary can be stunning too. So technology shouldn't be scary, just effortless and engaging. It should draw you in, invite you to sit and play a while. It should make your life easier. So humor isn't frivolous, it's absolutely necessary. And things are so much more, I know when I'm working on something, when you're having fun and having a good time, it's much more productive. And then ultimately the project ends up being, you know, has more vibrancy. So I want to grow, but I don't want to grow up. We inherently want to feel young at heart. So creativity is a leap of, across a chasm, unbridgeable by reason. So let me discover and make me think and make me smile entertain me. And when I check out, I'll leave far more than my room key. And again, we want them to feel a part of their legacy. They are a part of our legacy, and they bring our hotel and the experiences that they had um, home with them. So, okay, so that was our mantra. That was, that was sort of the essence, you know, touchy-groovy stuff. By the way, I mean, something like that took us, believe it or not, every image, every word, every phrase, I mean, these were presented in leather-bound books that we, I mean, to potentially not our partners, because we don't really, at that time, these are not partners, we, have, you know, we do everything ourselves as a family. But, you know, I, I remember when, when, we, when we designed Viceroy, we didn't, we didn't design Viceroy as a brand initially, or, or Core did it, and Kelly Worsler did an amazing job. But it was a product that was designed for the Pacific Shore Hotel that we own on Ocean and Pico. And, in many cases, if you use that as an analogy of trying to fit a square peg in a round hole or, or trying to 
really make something that doesn't deserve to be there or just doesn't fit. Um, what I have learned, and again, you know, I've been doing this as long as, long as I had, is these things may seem fun and they may seem like great little pictures and great little sayings, but they slowly start fine tuning you down or make sure that through conversation it evokes thought. When you're sitting with your head of operations for a hotel company that doesn't exist, you're sitting with a head of, you know, your chief creative officer for a company, for a hotel brand that doesn't exist. And when you're you have your head of development from a hotel company that doesn't exist, and we're all sitting around a room saying, guys, we're gonna build a hotel brand, no rush. <laughs> but let's see why we're building it. Let's not just make this brand, or let's not make this hotel, or the concept of it just being another chateau or another blah, blah, blah fit into the space of just the first hotel we buy. Let's make sure it's set the parameters, the DNA. And to me, as somebody who had been around this, and for me, who's somebody who's the perfect demographic of this, which is another thing that is we do very, very well, and not very well, but that's what we do, is, is we, we design what we believe is our interpretation of our generation's version of X, whatever X happens to be. Um, in this case, we're talking about the hotel. But that took four months, and that took couple hundred thousand dollars of, of consultants and you know, imagery and working with outside consultants in London, the UK, you know, in the UK and so forth and so on to help create this. And, and, and then at the same time, including our designer, who is a thinker, who was up here, it would be a much different conversation, um, Philippe Stark, who was the father of design of this movement now, now that he's trying to evolve into another movement, which hopefully we've done. This thing is the dedication, and it's also a very disciplined approach from that perspective. So True. Um, so again, what we did was um, we, we identified 15 trends and 15 words and one goal. And this exercise is about boiling down and creating guidelines that we would hear, would hear through. Um, the 15 trends, was, I'm not going to go through all of them. But we identified these 15 trends that influences our personal choices and our purchasing decisions. And I want to uh, clump a few together. Online oxygen, pre-Googling, and planned spontaneity, and buy now. These are all related because we're absolutely addicted to the internet and information. Uh, we are a buy now um, uh, society. Um, we know we know instantly if a trip is feasible or not. We can go online, we can check prices, we can competitively shop, um, we can check the airlines, we can bid, we can see customer reviews, and we can almost, we can take a virtual tour, and really we don't even have to go, because we can get it all on the computer if that's so what, what you know, drives us. But we can instantly know if, if a trip is feasible, and we're, again, we're so, you know, one of my things of, of what I, Eric, you asked, why do you do this? And one of the reasons why I do this is because what I see my team and I see our company and we're, again, everyone is attached to their BlackBerry and how many times the second you wake up, the minute you're like, read the BlackBerry or you drive in with the BlackBerry, you go like, you know. <laughs> and so it's like 24 hours a day, you're just addicted to this. By the way, that's how they go. I was just kidding. But, um, but no, but the, the reason, the thing for me is I am so afraid that our society is going to turn into a bunch of um, non-emotional androids because everything, like, we don't even speak to each other. We, like, sit down the hall, we, we do in our office because we love each other, which is true. Um, but, I mean, people email me and they don't even, they don't even communicate. They don't pick up the phone. There's no dialogue. There's no written letters. So one of my things of why I do this to answer your question is I want to remind people that they are human beings and emotions are good and you can't let that go because then we'll just be little androids and ants in a box. So, um, you your system? Yeah. <laughs> I missed Ladies and gentlemen, Ms. Teresa, Teresa Petito, okay. Reverend Teresa Petito, Pastor <laughs> Teresa Petito, <laughs> Rabbi Teresa Petito, <laughs> Maharaja Teresa Petito, Mula, I have the Mula thing I'm going to be tough. Now, another thing I want to talk about is curated consumption. Um, the other thing, it's true, that people are you know, following these, these um, editors of curated consumption, whether it's Martha Stewart or Oprah Winfrey. Oprah Winfrey tells you to buy a book, you buy the book. She tells you to vote for Obama, you vote for Obama. 
Um, so um, William Sonoma has become the curator of um, kitchens, um, restoration hardware of home decor, home improvement, pottery barn and casual living. So, so now more and more people are really prescribing and following these um, new curators of, of consumption. Um, I say, if you don't mind, why, why don't we use our, our case study? Why, why don't we take, uh, you want to take SLS or you want to take, uh, you want to take Sahara? We want to take SLS. Let's do Sahara, okay. Let's forget all these. Anyway, there's a fifteen trend you see. Okay. So, what do we want to make? No, 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 no. This is the Evelyn Wood, whatever. You can tell she's a branding guru. Um, okay, so 15 words. So what do we want to do? We want to be elegant, let, timeless, let, intelligent. Let, let, me shoot, let, me, let me shoot one, one just base case study before okay. we talk about one of our properties. How many of you guys are familiar with a, a property in, um, in New York called AOL Time Warner or the Time Warner Center where CNN is and, and so forth, right in the Columbus Circle? Okay. Well, let me tell you, explain to you how this may be reflected from an architectural standpoint and, and kind of what we do, why, it's, why I think we feel it's important. Okay, that's better. Um, AOL Time Warner was developed by a company called Relay, a company started by Steve Ross and Jeff Blau in 1992, preeminent developers in, in, in the country, I think. And they built this monstrosity, this beautiful, huge monster project in the Columbus Circle over Louis, overview of Park Avenue. And what was the net goal of what they were building is they were building retail, they bought the biggest boxes of retail you can imagine. They brought in restaurants, they brought in some of the masa, some of the best Japanese restaurants, they brought Mandarin Oriental as a hotel, they brought CNN as their global headquarters where you watch every day CNN, so forth. So they brought all these people ultimately to do what? Is to sell real estate because they owned over 400 residential units and condos, which were the most expensive condos in. Manhattan at the time, which traded at over $5,000 to $7,000 a foot. So what does that mean? What does that mean when we put a Katsuya at the ground floor of the Broadway building in Hollywood? There's an association. There's an association in our mind when our, cons our consumers who know that now there's a Katsuya going to be down here, oh, this place may be cooler than, than regular residential buildings. So as developers, we believe we can sell the, the units for 25 to 30% more. And as you're building a brand, and now as you're translating this same philosophy, if you, if you extrapolate that into bigger things, and how, how many times do you go to a place, or how many times do you go to stay in a hotel, how many times do you go rent an apartment, or whatever the case may be, that's close to something you recognize, and a brand that you're familiar with, a brand that you like. Um, and that's how these worlds have kind of blurred, where it's not just an apartment building you live in, it's an apartment building that has a coffee bean that has you know, it's, it's right around the corner from the Houston's that's very close to a Westfield shopping mall that now has a pink taco that never had. It's, it's, you know, it's slowly starting to become this, this, this association game. And the more brands, you look, at, you look at the Encore Hotel in Las Vegas or the Wynn Hotel in Las Vegas, what did he do? He went, and Steve Wynn was a genius at what he does. I put him up there with Steve Jobs and, and you know, uh, and Warren, but I mean, he's just a guy who just revolutionized hospitality and all levels, even though he's 60 something years old and blind, and he still had, he built the best product in the world. And he went and got the best chefs in the world and put them all under management contracts. So when you go to Vegas, for the most part, if you want the best chefs in the world, you're gonna to go to a, a win property. And, you know, brought the best nightclub operators. And just that conversation of nightclubs that have transformed within casinos, which happened, at, you know, very recently in Mandalay Bay, that's a compelling argument of flow and energy. And why not? Why let your customer leave your property? Um, both from an operation standpoint, and both from a from a layout and, and master planning perspective. Um, but I do know when I talk to our architects about nightlife and restaurants and energy, for the most part, two six of them are here. They don't really have much to add. Um, maybe they do, and they're just scared to tell me. But that's really where I think you can differ differentiate yourself from an architectural perspective, is really understand the next time you walk into a place that you like, why do you like it? Next time you walk into a, a, a nightclub or a bar or a hotel or an office building that you think is beautiful, go see how the flow is if you were working there. 
That's really the point, because that's really what the point is going towards. The point is going towards ease of access, as Teresa said. It's not about these, you know, I mean, you look at now, for example, in Central City with Gensler, this beautiful, you know, the, the, the Avenue of the Stars building, and what did they put? They put the food court, and they brought Kraft Steakhouse, and they brought all these places so people can stay on property so they can get CAA to rent space there. And now what does CAA want? They want the best food and beverage offer so they can take their clients there. It's this continuous circle before where, you know, before, if you go to the Sun America building, which is the best building in Central City, they had zero food and beverage, nothing. That's what the world is going to. Let's talk about. We have Sahara here. Yeah. Was Job security. <laughs> <laughs> now, four, four years ago, I went to Vegas, and I've been going to Vegas my whole life, and and really started seeing it with an owner's perspective or an owner's eye, and said, and we we'll, won't we'll get into this too much, Eric, and I know you're getting probably antsy about this, but it's actually a fun conversation because. This involved pension fund investment. This involved acquiring an asset that was 55 years old, built in 1952, so 56 years old. Um, this, this, evoked, this evoked all the facets of every discipline that we've talked about today, which was brand, 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 brand new ground up construction, re, re concepting a product that has been, in many cases, perceived as the oldest part of the oldest hotel in Vegas up there with the Tropicana, the Tropicana, the Riviera, the Sand, all the world, most of them were blown up actually. Um, the, north, the north side of the Strip, which was the original part of Las Vegas Strip, which is now completely, in many cases, not the hot part of the Strip. And so I was, mind you, to put it in context, I was 29 years old and we found the Sahara. It was for sale, it wasn't for sale, it belonged to a family, the father died. Um, and it took us a year to come up with a strategy on how to buy it, and we needed a lot of money. And getting back to Teresa's point, we went to, we had a very clear, concise message that we wanted to reposition, basically re-renovate, and with some brand new development involved, but not blow it up, um, a new white space that we felt that, that the Las Vegas market was needed, it was lacking, which was, high energy, very focused, boutique feel hotel. And you have to understand, this time, you have Wynn opening up, you have Jim Mirage doing their city center, you have the Palazzo, all these mega luxury resort hotels. And the essence of Vegas, the essence of what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas, and the essence of all that from Connect, all that was really going out the window because the average person, especially the average demographic that addresses us, which you know we have two million people that go through our doors in LA this year. Two million people will go through an SBE door this year. Um, and how do we, in the database that we have, and LA being the biggest feeder market for Las Vegas, how do, we, how do we find a property that will embrace these people to Vegas? At the same time, we already know what they like to eat, they like to drink, how they spend, they're already a member of our uh, VIP program, blah, 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 blah. And how do we find a property to take advantage of that? And how do you explain this to pension funds? Now, pension funds, I don't know how many guys have dealt with pension funds, I'm assuming not too many, but not the most. Um, That's uh, the sexiest thing. But, you know, we have to go raise $400 million of equity. Not even debt, just straight equity. And we, we, we ultimately got it um, and acquired the project. And, you know, um, legend has it that we're the youngest casino owner in the history of Las Vegas Strip. But we got it done not because of just the team that we had or the credibility we had in LA or, or how we were able to change, um, I think, LA's perspective in the, in, the, in the local community and also in the country from a, from a domestic perspective that LA now is a serious um, player in food and beverage and hospitality. But we got them through this process. We got the California State Teachers Pension Fund we got the New York State Teachers Pension Fund, the State of Texas Teachers Pension Fund, they got a check to build a high energy nightclub, casino in Las Vegas, in the old Sahara. And it went back to being able to describe what was in here or what was in there in a very methodical way. And before we had all this, imagine walking, trying to walk through a, a, an investor from Sacramento through the Sahara and say, we're gonna make this place really cool, trust me. 
Um, it wasn't a very easy task. No, but it was incredible, if I can interject too. I mean, that was an incredible experience because we were up against a major bank establishment, whatever you call it. Goldman Sachs. Okay, so no small, you know, whatever you call it. But, I mean, that's pretty big. And so we go in to the, you know, Sam, me, and Rosh, and we go to this presentation, it's, and there's almost as many bankers and investors and due diligence people and rah, 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 you know, sort of hammering us with questions. And the moral of the story is we went in, and I think you know one of the reasons why we got the project is, and, and again, we were sort of the underdog because oh, this is the you know this young kid, and they're going to make a club, and what the heck do they know? So, but we basically what we did is we basically designed the whole designed and priced out the whole entire project before we even presented it was so well thought through and we went above and beyond what they ever ever expected and what anyone presented to them so I mean, more importantly is we transported them because it, it came down to I don't get too specific but it came down to us and JP Morgan which is from the big institutional Wall Street banks we were 10 million dollars less in addition, I forgot to mention that. And the owners of this property had the Sahara, and they had the big piece of the property next door, that 22 acres on the Las Vegas Strip that we worked by. And we proved to them that if you sell it to us, 10 million less, which is what our investors would allow us to go up to, which is about 350 million or whatever the number was, is that we're gonna bring so much credibility and so much press and so much attention to this property that you're gonna make five times more than you're losing, that you're potentially giving us, you're gonna make in that property across the street. Um, and they bought it, and it worked, and three months later, they sold the property across the street to MGM Raj with Saul Kersler, who's a company, Kersler International, if you've been to the Atlantis and one and only, for $20 million an acre, what well, they were expecting to sell it for $12 million an acre. And the property's just south of us sold to a guy named, uh, um, Packard, who owns Crown Hotels out of Australia, for $22 billion an acre. Mind you, we didn't pay that much, so we looked really smart. Um, but the question became, what the hell do you do now with this hotel? Uh, even though we had figured it all out conceptually, now we had to get into it. And I think there's a gentleman here named Steve Roof who can explain to you that this, what you're seeing now is probably a year and a half of work, a year and a half of consultants, MEP, just getting into these walls of these buildings that were 40, this is where, this is where Elvis and Aunt Margaret used to hang out. The first time the Beatles ever came to, the only time they ever came to Las Vegas, they were here, Johnny Carson, I mean, there's so much history. How do you maintain the history at the same time reinvent the brand and reinvent the property? At the same time, you can't blow it up because you don't have the money. At the same time, you gotta redefine it because you're going against the comp set, which we talked about earlier, that's Palms, Hard Rock, the hotel, so forth and so on. And with with Starks, this is really bad for my neck. With, oh, look over. Who is trying to mother me? Who is trying to mother me? Eat your vegetables, do this, drink too much coffee. I can see it. Anyway. Um, but the point being is, through endless amounts of consultants, we came up with what we believe is SLS Las Vegas. And again, we don't have the money, which we'll start instruction next year. We can talk about Miami here to talk about, but just for Eric's sake, I know he's probably wants us to get off stage. But this was an incorporation, and as you can tell there, there's a actually a 58-story high-rise behind it's a glass curtain wall system with 14 at the top, which is our restaurant on Sunset. Um, and it's about close to three and a half, four million square feet. And from the perspective of what we talked about now, this is kind of, you know, if you, if you play high school basketball, then you go, let's say you play college basketball, then you get picked up, and this is the finals for us. Um, in addition to all the other stuff we're doing. This is something we're really excited about, but at the same time, scared shitless about. Um, because you're going up against, you know, I mean, you, you, when you hit the ground in Vegas, the first thing they tell you is, everything's done in Vegas this way. There's no natural light. There, you don't put a clock up in a casino. You can't tell people what time because they're also stop gambling because they, and we tested everything. We tested every parameter. 
Um, and it so happened that when I told our investors three years ago that we want to bring natural light to the, into the casino, we want our pool open into the casino, we want our hotel guests, if they want to just be hotel guests and not go into the casino, we're going to give them an entrance. And they're going to go up to the room, and they don't have to walk 15,000 miles to get to their room through the casino, through this, through that. Because at the end of the day, if they want to gamble, they're going to gamble. If they don't, they don't. And it just so happened through the last two years, uh, through the openings of hotels like Encore, which is Steve Woods' newest hotel, and uh, you know, through all these other hotels now that we're, we have the ability of seeing through the designs and the new hotels, that's what, if you walk Encore right now, Encore's whole base is a pool in the center, all natural light, a complete hotel entrance. And not that I'm saying that Steve wouldn't copy me, uh, but what I'm saying is that the thought and the confidence of the thought, because I knew what that customer wanted because I was the customer. And I was designing for something for myself. And I guess without getting too theoretical or too specific or getting too drawn out, that's what we do every day. We design things that we like. We design things that we want to go to. You know, we make movies. And we design movies that I want to go see. Not just because they, okay, you gotta make a horror film for 16 year olds and blah, blah, blah. And if you can do that, if you can be, know your space, know your white space, um, and also understand how it relates to how the world is changing, which is a conversation all of its own, you will start seeing that your design may change. You may start seeing that maybe I won't be that crazy in my tower that I wanna build or that my own cartoon or my own SLS, everybody's own SLS. Maybe you say, you know what, can the developer really build this? Or is that guy who's gonna have this office space in this corner, will he really get a view? Because I really wanna make this building look really cool. Can I sell this to investors? Can I, sell, would anybody fund this? If you guys can do that and come out of this program and come out of this amazing university that I've had the pleasure of sharing uh, last year of my life with, if you come out with three or four or five steps ahead, just by thinking that way, it's taken us, taken me 11 years to start thinking, you know, understanding that's the way to think. And Teresa's only 23, so it's taken you, what, two years? Two years? <laughs> so I think, I, I think, I think we'll, we'll open up, we'll open it up for, for, for questions if there's any, but that's really the, was the highlight of giving you guys a snapshot to a company that runs and builds nightclubs, that runs and builds restaurants, that can master plan this and acquire this and sell it to somebody before we can even get them to show this and make them believe in us because there's a lot of legwork. As you guys know, there's a lot of legwork and a lot of knowing your market and it's not fun. It's fun when you walk into one of your nightclubs and everyone's buying bottles of stall and there's celebrities and blah, blah, blah. That's fun, but it takes a lot of work to build that, and it takes a lot of work to maintain that. And a lot of people have tried, failed, a lot of people have tried to be successful, but this is at least a little snapshot into our madness, so hopefully you guys have enjoyed it. Thank you. and the love of what you're doing. I have to say, uh, for someone who's listened to a number of lectures and also given a couple, this is probably a unique lecture in this school, as you know. Um, the students are, are, are used to hearing and, and thinking about the business that you're involved with in a somewhat different way. And one of the things which is at least worth discussing a bit has to do with the definition of a word you you guys used a number of times, which is new. 
and what's new or what constitutes new. And I should say, if you walk around the school, for better and for worse, you'll see a whole series of things that, that probably look somewhat different than, than what you guys are doing. And if you use a motif, for instance, it comes from the 1930s, and you, or if you turn a lamp upside down, it wasn't too long ago, if you turn a lamp upside down, they run you out of the town. But in a way, now, everybody turns everything upside down. You know what I mean or not? So, so the question is, is it dangerous to turn a lamp upside down? Or is it in some way reinforcing the kind of, you know, in a way, it's like saying, if everybody's outside the box, then there's, there's, there's probably no box any longer. It might be better to be inside. Um, so I, I think that if the first question would be, how do you define, if you can define, what constitutes new or innovative or a change in your industry? How, how do you define that? Well, uh, using your, your analogy of turning a lamp upside down, if all you did was turn a lamp upside down, you'd be in trouble because it's, it's like I said, design is a facet. Uh, and once you get past the smoke and mirrors, it, it gets to what any good operator gets to, which is operations, service, accountability, consistency. And no matter how cool a place is, no matter how trendy or hot, and that's why we use the word timeless, but you know, you know, we've bet our company on pushing the envelope. But we push the envelope, as you can see, not just by gut or not just by you know, telling our designers to do something that's really crazy. You, you, we, push the, we, we push the envelope based off of some sense of, of an equation that says, we're going to have enough stuff that's going to be great and shiny and you know, kind of like the shiny, the coin. At the same time, there's going to be a sense of home. There's going to be a sense of purpose. There's a reason to exist. Do we deserve to exist? And that is a tough question once you once you spend some time really thinking about it when you're sleeping at night before you go to sleep before you let a project like this go, especially because you know these projects take six years of your life just to build, and then God knows how many years to operate and how many headaches and how many roadblocks and how many it's it's ridiculous and you know this and. So I guess it's, it goes back to the confidence of, and going back to the analogy of turning the lamps upside down. Is it a gimmick? Is it, is, it, is it a way of saying we're looking at things differently? Yes, but at the same time, in the case of Esmar that you referred to the upside down lamp, we were the first place that the table side mixology, where we actually brought, in the case of a bar, we brought the bar to you. We had seven kiosks, these small little kind of things that you see like an airplane to bring you the food. And we brought them up. We brought the bar and the way how you hand make drinks and how you, you know, make shots of coming. It was an experience. So you left there walking in like, cool, these lamps are upside down. Then you said, we sat down and you said, wow, this, this beautiful guy or girl comes up to you and brings a little cart and takes your bottle or teaches you how to make. You left there with an experience. You left there, that you, you, you left there with something that you really felt that um, you gained. And all of a sudden, you took ownership of it. And guess what? You went and you told your friend, and I went to this place that has a cool lamp, but I learned how to make a kamikaze, and I learned this, and they come to your table, and, that, and that's the word of mouth brush fire that marketing can't buy you, or, or ads in the magazines can't buy you. And that's really what we've, we've, we've established our company on. Is it cool that Paris Hilton's there, or that's going to, all that stuff helps, sure it does, but for timelessness, it is, and to evoke new thought, it all depends on how much you're willing to risk. Uh, in the case of SLS and our hotel brand, you know, we took a huge, huge, huge risk in our main food and beverage retail concept called the Bazaar. 12,000 square feet, six concepts with no walls. I mean, really, like, imagine a food court designed by Philippe Stark with Murray Moss, one of the best retailers out of Manhattan with uh, Jose Andres, one of the craziest Spanish chefs you'll ever see, one of the most talented and passionate people you'll ever meet. Um, at the same time, our lobby three mill restaurant was the same. I mean, it was designed by Philippe Stark, but it, there was a sense of home. Our spa is probably one of the nicest spas you'll ever be, you've ever been to in LA. Our gym is 2,500 square feet, our rooftop. So there's bits and pieces where I guess you can 
take that leap of faith and you want to set your mark. Um, but you better have some substance behind you. I think, I think my point, and I think in, in the discourse around this place has, has something to do with encountering something you don't know and don't recognize as, as an asset or as an advantage, meaning the invention of, of space or of form or of shape or of texture, which takes the discussion somewhere it hasn't been, as opposed to looking at, at the aggregate of ideas where in, in some ways what you're looking at in combination is not something you haven't seen before. Maybe the art of it has to do with a recombination of things. Or I mean, one other thought. Uh, that, that there are a couple of ways of looking at this work, one of which would be not to look at it in terms of what it looks like, but to understand it in terms of the way it's organized. There was a, there was a character around, I guess, in the, in the history of what you call hospitality, making hotels. A guy by the name of John Portman, who I think, you know, that he was, I think, an architect, actually, before he was a developer and made peach tree and he made one in O'Hare, but the, uh, the argument was you make a hotel, it's gotta be a double loaded quarry, and you don't make a double loaded quarry out of business. And he started to do this atrium stuff, and I think there was an old one in Denver, and it was called the Brown Palace, I don't know, I mean, he used to have a teacher by the name of Morton Zuckerman, I don't know whether you know Morton, he, he talked about a lot of those things. And what's interesting about, about what, what I think you're proposing, which might be very literally useful for for Sciarc students is you walk into a casino and you pull the roof off. Or you walk into a casino and you stick the biggest clock anybody's ever seen on the wall. Those kinds of things. And, and it's not so much what it looks like in a literal sense, although that's critical to you, but the conception of what works because everybody said so and everybody does it that way, regardless of, of ultimately what it looks like is something that you guys seem to have questioned and pushed and interrogated and challenged. Is that, I mean? Well, I, mean I mean, I can tell you for a lot of I mean, when, we, when we put our Katsuya in Brentwood, right, I mean, this is a seven million, six million dollars, seven million dollar investment in a sleepy town in Brentwood. And here's a Philippe Stark brand, it's our first Philippe Stark project that we actually are opening. We, this, we had so many designs, but this is the first one. People said, you're crazy. What are you doing putting a Katsuya in Brentwood in a place that had been out of business 20 times? the base of an office building, like I said, that's horribly laid out. And we looked at it in a different perspective. We said, you know, there is, again, it's again like knowing your environment, and knowing your comp set, and knowing your, knowing your demographic. I knew because I lived in Brentwood, and I knew because I knew who else lived in Brentwood, the kind of people lived in Brentwood. If you can build an environment, not a clubby, you know, very trendy restaurant, but an embracing restaurant that was just, just enough pushing the envelope, where Katsuya was by far the, the newest thing, if you want to use the word new, in that marketplace, but there was a lot of people who did not want to go west, east, excuse me, of the 405. And we took that chance. It was a big gamble, especially for the first of a brand. Sometimes you'll do the 30th one, it didn't work, it didn't work, but the first one, especially that's it. And it was unbelievably successful, and it has been now for three years. And it's worked on cylinders that we couldn't even conceptualize, that we didn't even think would work. Where at 5.30 you got kids coming in, Seven o'clock, you have families coming in and business dinners, and at nine o'clock, you got the cougars of Brentwood coming around. Right? <laughs> Go cougars! Um, we need them. Think of some of the room tonight. Cougars. Um, what is a male? Is that, why is that just a woman, female expression? What is a man? It's just a regular man. That's what it is, right? The cougars are divorced women, and the man is a man. <laughs> Is that why there's no term for a man on the prowl? It's a woman on the prowl? Okay. I was wondering. I never thought about that. Just a man. Anyway. But um, I, I, a lot of it has to do with your environment. I mean, if, if, you, if you're looking to do something, and like when you go to the Milan Furniture Fair, and you want to talk about new thought, especially in the case of furniture or design, um, you'll see the most unbelievable forward-thinking things that I've seen outside of the halls of Sire. And, you know, if, if you were to do like a hotel there, like a Bulgari or something, really, really, or in London, the people there can appreciate it. Now, my biggest challenge in Vegas with Philippe Starr 
was explaining to him that 95% of our demographic that's gonna to come to our hotel is gonna come from Bakersfield. It's coming from Kansas. It's coming from, you know, Steve is there, Steve is our good thing, is I have to walk up through New York, New York. Can you imagine walking Philippe Stark through New York, New York? Well, it's not fun. This is shit. Everything you Americans are crazy. Everybody's so fat. What do these people do? They're Martians. Like, where do they come from? I mean, but the realization of if you move the pendulum in Vegas, 5%, you've left your legacy in Vegas because everything was exactly the same. Everybody's the same general contractor, same architects, same designers. I mean, there was, I mean, obviously, the Bellagio, you have the fountain, the Luxor, you have the pyramid, everything became thematic, and then ultimately everything became um, luxury. And then now with the gym, with their new project, City Center, it's all about architecture. City Center is probably the biggest independently financed project in the country, North America. And it's all about Daniel Livishka and just every, it's like the who's who. It's like they went, in, Steve went in with chefs, they went in with architects. And, you know, it's, you know, can a city like that absorb that? Can, can the conventioneer from Dallas or, you know, the guy who's coming in for the CES, the Consumer Electronics Show, does he really care? Um, I know I care, I know you care, I know she cares, but we're not the ones filling that hotel of 7,000 rooms Monday through Thursday. We may go there on the weekend with, with so that, that's really, it's, it's, I think you gotta pick your battles. Um, I think the other point is, is when we sit around and talk about our project and design, and we may be saying new in this conversation, but there's rarely a time that we'll, I'll hear him say, or anyone say, Oh, just do, give me something new, give me something new. We never say that. If we do say something, what we're looking for is a new thought process. How can you bring the concept of a bazaar into um, a space? So how do you bring the non-traditional, marry the non-traditional with the traditional, and how did you deliver something? Because honestly, none of us are really interested in doing anything new just for newness sake because there's a beauty in tapping into historical references and what has been done. The trick is, is how do you present it in a way that has a new thought process around or a twisted thought process around? And again, I want to go back to the, to the bizarre concept is the thought of a true bizarre where it's hectic and colorful and you never know what you're gonna see around the corner. So it's not about you know coming up with new and hanging the light. Right. How do you do it? Because at some point you risk, you risk sensory overload. You risk your customers coming in and saying, you know what, this is just too much. Um, and with the bazaar, we tested that. I think we I mean what the, I think the bazaar at SLS, which is our restaurant at SLS, um, is nothing like this is so ambitious that nothing like this had ever been done on the I think in, in really the modern world that I know of. It's taking the, the, that soup from Istanbul that we were talking about earlier and bringing it in on La Cienega within a hotel with some of the most amazing collaborators, which by itself, in its own sense, had the biggest problems because now you have three of the biggest avant-garde people, including me, I don't know how much of an ego, but three really big egos, three and a half. And that's where you test it, but if it didn't work, you could shut down and redo the restaurant. You're not redoing your whole hotel. And I think that, that was the point. The point is, luckily it's work that's right now, you know, the, it's, I mean, it's unbelievably successful. Um, I mean, last night was the last, to Tuesday night, I mean, we had, we had lines outside the door in the recession. You know, luckily some of our partners were in there. And, and so it's because people, I think, really starved something new, but they also, at the same time, when they went and sat down, we serve a traditional top of Spanish food some of the stuff that's the most basic, you know, ingredients from the Ottoman Empire or some of the things that, and then it's about service. It's a, at some point they forget their surroundings, it's about the food, it's about their relationship with their server, it's about the great wine. That's where the smoke and mirrors go. If it was just about design. It's almost know. the anti-new, because. I, I, I'd like to ask a question about some of these ideas. In, in a way, some of the things that you're proposing require buying into the idea of a city that's vanished or forgotten, for example. So the property in Miami, the Sahara, even uh, Vine in Hollywood and Vine, 
There are places that are kind of abandoned in a way that they're no longer cool, that you then overlay, well, this could be cool if we made it into something that it isn't no, any longer. And it's, it's or really, once was. Or once was. And so it's kind of acquiring of this, it's, it's asking of the city something to, to kind of rub against your concept of very sophisticated, extremely beautifully solved interiors, something that's gritty and something that's kind of tough. And what happens when then the project is successful, the literati and the um, luminati come, and then that toughness disappears? Well, I think, I mean, the, the, you know, let's use Hollywood and Mind as an example. Hollywood, you know, we went to the corner of Hollywood and Mind, and you know, I used to work, one of the first jobs I had, they were, I used to work for Ripley's Believe It or Not Museum in Hollywood and Highland. I don't know if you guys know that, but actually, I, I was part of my dad owned the building and we did a deal with Ripley's. And I was on the corner there with my safari hat, <laughs> trying to get people to come in. And this is when Hollywood, 17 years ago, mind you, when Hollywood, there was no Hollywood, there was drug dealers and prostitutes. And it was fun when you're 16, it's fun to see all this. <laughs> Very good times, but so I, I remember Hollywood then. Now you look at Hollywood Vine, um, and working with Councilman Eric Garcetti, who, uh, you know, part of the redevelopment zone, and we we're very involved in that perspective in every council office and the mayor and so forth and so on. And I, at some point, you you when you become successful, the guy next to you comes and he becomes successful, and the W is going to open across the street. You know, I mean, there's a reason why we did it, uh, and you know, you you have to believe that. If, if you're trending, you're dead. Because there's other places in Hollywood, like Geisha House and some of these other places that were very short-term trending. But you know, we believe we, we delivered a product there that was as the same level as we del delivered in Brentwood. It was probably one of the most high affluent deliveries in the city into one of the most decrepit parts of the city. But we delivered on the same level. We delivered it the same way, the same service, the same quality, the same food. We didn't lower our standards. We kept the brand consistent. And from that perspective, we, you know, we always feel that, well, were we the newest ones? Yes, will other places come and be around us? If you look at Soho or the Meatpacking District, for example, a perfect example right now, right? The Meatpacking District, you know, when the first Lotus or the first Pastis, some of the first places that went there, they're still relevant. I mean, Pastis and some of the, you know, now they have everybody in the corner, everybody there. The Meatpacking District isn't cool anymore. That's the problem. Now everyone's trying to go, you know, either further down. Um, downtown, or they want to 27th Street, or go try to go to 11th. So, I mean, sometimes you are a function of your own success because you are, you know, you become more mainstream. But I don't know if that answered your question. Okay. I don't know. that uh, footprint design aside, because design is a function of taste. Um, I think what we were able to do, what are able to do, and why consistently we spend a lot of time, money, and energy doing is putting a team together of very, very, very sophisticated uh, restaurateurs. When you want to be a restaurateur, you got to be a restaurateur. And you have to deliver consistently time in and time out. Food's got to be good. The service's got to be good. And I'm not saying, and I use the analogy of Geisha House not because of, not that I like them or dislike them or they're competitors or they're not competitors and actually they, they, they've done unbelievably well and they were one of the first people in Hollywood with a restaurant. But um, I do also know the infrastructure of the product and it was unbelievably you know, designed for its time, very different than ours, but different. And um, I, think, I think quality is what separates us. Quality. But the other thing is, um, it's a quality service, but there's also, you either make it an emotional connectivity with the guest or you don't. And, you know, we believe that if you can make that emotional connectivity, then it is going to retain that guest and you, you can retain it and attain more. Because, you know, again, we believe that emotional um, connectivity has value and people place a value on, on I'm feeling good or feeling great or feeling sexy or, or feeling smarter or feeling part of the club. It's kind of, of um, zeroing in on those, those emotions that make people feel good. And and for, everybody it's different. for everybody, it's different. I mean, you walk into one of our hotels and people say, I 
love your rooftop pool. I, it's the nicest rooftop pool I've ever seen. Or somebody says, I love your gym. I, it's the best gym I've ever seen. I kind of won't get the rooms, but the gym's great. So you can't tell. I mean, that's the point is you have to make an effort across the board, hoping that maybe people like our big crap handles in your question, or maybe they like the design, maybe they like the fact that our drink was number one drink in LA uh, by LA Magazine, we keep winning. We don't know, but we try to throw everything at the wall and hopefully something will stick and make us different. Any other questions from the audience? Yes? You know what? He's young. I'm old. I, I'm, I'm almost old enough to be emergency serious. Like, like I'm not going to say that. This is the reason for that. But <laughs> no. But the point is, that, let me get something straight. His lifestyle is 100,000 percent different than my lifestyle. So, um, and like, and seriously, I'm I'm old and I'm exhausted and I don't go to our clubs. So, um, so, but the point is, is that there are. Um, Everybody has diverse needs within themselves. And everybody, um, I think, has this sense of, of youthfulness and wanting to belong and aspiration and inspiring. So he's thinking the way he's thinking, but I bring another perspective. And his family brings another perspective. And between the global and the age difference, and that was exactly his point, is that, that he outgrew the W, that he, you know, he, he outgrew the W. So, and, and, if, and I really outgrew the W. So, so the point is, is, I'm thinking, hmm, I'm still not dead, I still have a personality, I'm still alive, I'm not ready for the almond pori where, you know, I could, you know, die of boredom. So there's, and, and again, it's, it's, a, it's a psychographic of the young at heart, the young spirit, and, and the other thing that what we realize is not everybody does want to go to a club, and not everybody wants to be seen in the thick of things. And, and with SLS, we've given the, the guest a choice. If you want to walk into the thick of things and join the party, woohoo, go for it, and go through the bazaar. If you want a sense of privacy as a guest, you can go into the guest lobby. So, and also if you're having a party there, you don't have to go through the bazaar, you don't have to go through the guest lobby, we've provided you an option there. There's a lot of um, flexibility. flexibility. There you go. I, mean, I think exactly. that, to answer your question, you know, uh, if it just pertains to the clubs, you're right, because you grow old, you mature, you still want to go to the clubs. I mean, you, know, you can't be the 50 year old guy trying to say what's cool because you know, unless it's just not going to work. Um, I know a couple that uh, <laughs> just can't, can't get out of the business. Um, but as we've grown and our company has grown and our projects have matured, um, so I mean, so have we, and I think we're a reflection of our project. Having said that, um, when you do go to our venues, excluding the clubs, um, even though you'd be surprised how many six-year-old Wall Street bankers love going to our clubs, um, and, so, yes. um, and we have infrared cameras in our clubs, so that's why we get our fun financing. Um, different conversation, um, but but. If you, go to, if you go to our venues, you'll see, and this is what we pride ourselves on, we have 60-year-old couples eating with their friends. You have 22-year-olds sitting and having a girls' night out. You have a, a father and a son and a family. It's, it's miraculous, the demographic and the psychographic uh, across, the, across the generation in our venues, excluding the clubs. Now, the clubs are obviously you know, meant for high volume, high energy, young people, um, or people, not even older people, people who want that kind of environment. But if you go to, like I said, if you go to 14, last night, I was at 14, we had the mayor, Leo Grossa, with one of the biggest agents in Hollywood. You had a group of, like, I think it was like eight, 60 year old women who were having their girls' night, girls' day, whatever it was. And you had a bunch of young, beautiful people. And 
he was a cross section of LA, a high affluent side of LA, but a cross section of LA. And it had nothing to do with, you know, it almost got to the point where I kind of didn't fit in, so I left. But, um, <laughs> except for the 22 year old table, this was kind of cold. Um, just kidding. Um, and so. What would make your restaurant, why do you think your restaurant's better than another restaurant, or if you do, why do you do so, and so forth and so on. You know, we, we try to do a restaurant in, in, um, in Santa Monica, Montana, um, five years ago. And it was the old Wolfgang Pub Cafe, and had the only liquor license. I mean, after I'm a real estate guy by nature. That's what I do, and that's how I think. So I perform as it's, so in the restaurant space, in the nightclub space, or in the hotel space, usually you don't have real estate guys running performance on the back of you know, seven year projections. Hey, this is a cool place, let's do a place. Let's go raise 50 investors, and that's how that world was. Um, and you know, when I got into that world, I went and bought the best leases in town, the best licenses in town, knew the license, knew the, knew the actual permitting process. And when it, not only when we started building successful nightclubs, we went and locked up all the nightclub promoters that they could only promote for us. It was the first time ever in LA that it happened, so it was kind of, for a time period, we had a monopoly in the nightlife business. Then we found this place in, in um, in Santa Monica, and we decided to do a Pan Asian restaurant with a chef that was okay, a little tanked. I mean, lived the first month, the first month it was okay, the second month started dying out, and it just completely bombed, bombed, embarrassing. Like it was like really bad. The food was unedible. I got I got stomach flu a couple of times eating it myself, and it was it was a very good lesson to learn that if you want to be a restaurateur, you better be a restaurateur. If you want to be a hotelier, better be a hotelier. If you want to be all three, fine. Make sure you have enough people that understand every live and breathe that. Um, and we ended up turning it into a bar, and it did very well. Um, so that was that was one of the things where there actually was a transitional point for me personally, is you know, when, when you're in the business that we are, of opening yourself up consistently. You know, in 2008, we opened seven places. We released two movies. We had press announcements on Vegas and so forth and so on. And you're consistently opening your, 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 you're putting yourself out there. And it's not like you have a tire company that, you know, you don't sell that many tires this year. You know, no one's gonna, you know, if your investors will know, your, your family may know, but it's not gonna be public knowledge and bloggers. It's just, it's unbelievable the amount of attention the clubs and restaurants get. But, you know, through time you start building a thick skin you start realizing that you're not, you don't buy, A, you don't have to buy your hype. You don't buy the ones you're really successful. You have to remember one day you're not going to be very successful, especially in the case of the nightlife goes. Um, and more importantly, how do you keep reinventing yourself? You brought up the idea of hotels. You know, we have, you know, CapEx budgets and reserves and so forth and so on. And hopefully our hotels are going to be timeless or every 10 or 15 years they're going to need refreshing. And they're already pre-designed that way. In the case of, for, in the case of, um, Another example, we did a place called Foxdale. Foxdale originally was a restaurant downstairs and a nightclub upstairs. And the restaurant downstairs was initially designed as a lounge and a nightclub park. And we decided halfway through to bring a great chef who was a good friend of ours to have her be. She got on top chef and she, and she was just a great person, very talented, but it only had 60 seats. So the kitchen was minuscule. The kitchen was the size of this table. And, you know, we learned through the process, it, it, was, it wasn't a failure. And it wasn't a great success. And we ended up turning it back into what it originally was designed for, which was a two floor nightclub. But all these things kind of give you a little more context and a little bit more. Again, was it a, was it a personal hit? Was it a, you, know, you think you fit? But you learn. And I think as Teresa said, if you just keep doing this long enough where you learn, you learn, you know, ultimately you'll have a lightning, you know, you'll come across these with a lightning in a bottle. For us, Kansui is lightning in a bottle. We think 14 and SLS and Hyde. I mean, Hyde was the number one bar 
lounge in LA, in the country, for a year and a half. Hands down. I mean, that could, anybody could want to see. It actually started a revolution of small, intimate lounge bars that, you know, that ultimately Winston's and the Villa and all these other places it started a movement that ultimately, when I, when I go to my friends in New York who joke about LA nightlife, say, we want to do a high in New York. We want to do a high in my head. It was, but again, we just knew the fundamentals of what we knew of building a cool place, building a very well-designed place, offering a $18 martini, but handmade, hand eyes, some of the stuff that we'd seen in New York um, or in Miami. And it was in the middle of a strip mall on Sunset next to the Laugh Factory. I've been asked to announce that I'll be asking the last question. Uh, uh, earlier in the conversation, you were talking about uh, one of the, the primary theses about the, the kind of places that you make being about flows. And I think that when we as architects hear that term, we're, we're generally uh, we're generally talking about circulation, but as you talked about it, it became clear that you were talking about a combination of circulation, the way it's being used, or the way it functions, and ultimately the creation of a kind of environment or an atmosphere that flows from valet to valet, as you put it. Full stop on that. Um, and then uh, um, a few minutes ago, you said that design was a matter of taste which is, I think, something that probably doesn't set well with, with a lot of us. And it primarily has to do with the feeling that somehow uh, style being a matter of taste is a predetermined issue, as though you go to a place, and if it happens not to be a style that your taste is suited to, uh, it's not for you. But it seems like, given your uh, interest in creating a kind of full environment, that you must believe that that has the ability, in a sense, to, to, to overcome that predetermined matter of taste. As though the creation of a full environment, knowing that you may not be into the Baroque or uh, Art Deco, because you've created a full environment, it allows you to overcome that. And I'm, I'm, I'm wondering if that's a fair characterization. Um, I, I, I definitely, I mean, depending, depending on what space you're talking about and kind of what, but just in general, speaking in generalities, you do, you do at some point go to a place that you may not really care for the design, but, you know, that's when I get back to the point of saying, if I, if I end up putting images of Japanese lips on this wall and I take this and I put the back bar here and you can't get to the food and you can't get, no matter how pretty a place is, if you have a comfortable time going there, chances are you're not going to go back. You know, I always use the philosophy, everybody's going to come to your place once. It's getting them back the second time is the hard part. And when we talk about flow and, and when you talk about design and you know, some of the best restaurants you go to, if just think about maybe personally yourself who asked the question, Maybe some of the best restaurants you go to, you may not know why you go there. You may not, you may not go there, definitely may not be for the design. You go there because they know you. They will greet you at the door, they say hi, Mr. Job, whatever the case may be. The food is great, it's a, the price point's great. So that's why I said I said taste gets them there. So let I mean the design gets them there. Oh, it's a new Philippe Stark this, or it's a new SPE this. That's what gets them there. But once they're there, you got to hit them with the things that are core and fundamental, and that's meeting expectations, and setting expectations to the point that, that you're delivering them as your restaurant or hotel. Those sheets better be comfortable. I don't care how cool the bazaar is. Um, that toilet better work. That toilet, you know, that you know, you better have, you know, you better have toilet paper. You better have a good shampoo, and you better have, you know, a great visibility. You know, in our in our rooms at SLS, the flat screen, as we're talking about hiding technology, is behind huge mirror in every one of the rooms, a glass box mirror. So when you turn it on, so it's not a, it's a 40 inch Sony flat screen in every room. And you know, but end of the day, that flat screen, that TV, it's so cool design, the speakers are built within this encasing that's all mirror, but it better work. And if you want to get lodged in it, if you want to watch a move, then you just stop going. It could be really cool. So that's I think where design is, is it, 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 you gotta get behind the smoke and mirrors. I don't know if that answered your question. I mean, I'm really, to answer any of the questions. No, no, it's perfect. I, thanks very much again for your time. I wanted to throw out something that I think is more than a curiosity for students. It has to do with the contemporary world and the politics and the sociology of the contemporary world. 
and which wouldn't necessarily mandate that you'd build a club out of photovoltaic cells or something. But on the other hand, or that you would use the kind of fabrication, engineering, design, technology, which you can put out on a spreadsheet now with a CATIA system and quantify it and cost it out, and it's actually almost as, 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 as inexpensive or manageable to build uh, an enormously complicated idea as it was in former times to differentiate a complicated idea from, from a simpler idea. I was trying to think of something. Have you been in and out of the Incheon Airport recently, this no. South Korea? But there's a huge egg. It looks like some, a, a small, it's enormous metal egg with a whole series of odd pieces. It's, it's like a ballroom. It's right in the middle of, of, of an airport which has kind of enormous power. It may not be novel in an LA sense, but the implementation of it at, at a huge scale is, I think, interesting because it shows what you can do and what you can make as opposed to as a do in travel. And it struck me that whether it's, it's issues of, of energy or engineering and fabrication, in terms of the kinds of things that we can now build pretty readily, you guys haven't yet taken a look at, at changing the language or, or exploiting that capacity that, that form-making, engineering, drawing capacity and paying for it and, and, and being able to measure it again on a spreadsheet. Uh, and the question is whether that's, that you might be going in the end somewhere different because if, if, if we send Teresa there, actually, a lot of, a lot of the, the congenial sociology she's talking about might be harder to measure. I don't know, for instance, if anybody, if anybody interrogated the passengers who are mostly just hustling in and out for all the usual reasons in airports, about whether that, that, that configuration, that odd building, is actually effective. But I think all I'm saying is there's, there's still a lot of room and the subject matter, whether it's for political reasons, the social reasons, the energy reasons, or whatever it is, and the technology actually allows you to stretch a hell of a lot further than you've actually stretched. And the historic reference, I mean, you're, you're saying it isn't necessarily new for the sake of new, but on the other hand, references to what you know and what you recognize and where you've been and what makes you comfortable and familiar, all of that is, is certainly part of the pro forma that you, that you put in your package. So uh, the, the question really is an open-ended question about whether you think you've, you've analyzed it and measured it and understand it and understand your constituency or whether there's an expansion capacity in that, that the constituency is ready for something quite different in a different form, in a different language, with different social and political meanings, particularly, I mean, Sam made a reference to this, it's an obvious point, the, the, the conditions that we're dealing with now, which in my lifetime, and certainly your lifetime, are entirely new. I haven't seen it before. And the question is whether any of that would be germane to your, as it goes ahead, or whether you think, you know, you've got it figured out. Now. No, no, I, I definitely think we don't have it figured out. Uh, and that's that's our daily that's the daily cross we bear, especially me. I constantly am putting myself around people that are so much smarter than me and I've seen so much more than me. And I think one of the reasons that I've been somewhat successful is that I've really been able to sit at the knees of some of the best real estate minds and, and, and be able to translate it. And also, you know, partner with people like Teresa, partner with people like Philippe Stark, and partner with people that give you that instant not instant credibility, but not just its credibility, but also a sense of depth that I will never have, or a sense of way the brains work that I, my brains can never work. And knowing what you're good at, and more importantly, knowing what you're not good at. But getting back to your point of the, the concept of pushing design, I guess in the sense of you know, the, the effects maybe this egg has, or this thought that this egg has, obviously it's being, a, I'm sure, a, a, a publicly funded thing versus a privately funded thing. Um, but 
what we're in the business of today more than ever, and where we think that we need to better improve, where we think the upside is getting to know our customers better, even more. And again, it's one thing a very, very, very good guy told me out of New York, was one of the best hedge fund operators, I don't know any more today, but he's one of the best ones. And he said, if you can build a pretty box, but deliver it with service and know your clients, you can be the next Rosewood in Four Seasons or Salt Gersner because those people have kind of become obsolete now just by a function of age. And that's what we strive for every day, is knowing our customers, anticipating what they want. To many ways, you know, when you're in the light, nightlife business, you kind of tell them what they should want. When you're in the restaurant business, you know, a little bit of, a little bit of both, because they have context. But when you're in the hospitality hotel business, especially when you're doing 2,500 rooms in Vegas, you gotta react and think of what they would want. That's where the paradigm changes. And that's when design and all these other things are crucial. But end of the day, it's how am I gonna, you know, how am I gonna get from point A to point? You gotta start knowing your customer, understanding your customer, and knowing everything that Teresa says, pre-Googling, what does that mean? And for example, a subtle example, is every one of our POS stations and our restaurants, we have a Google. So anybody who walks in, or whether it be our VR centralized market reservation system goes back to our restaurant. You know, when Eric keeps coming into our restaurants, we start building a database on you. And we start knowing that you like to sit outside and you like to drink red wine and you know you're allergic to mushrooms and you know, you know, don't he likes to talk, don't don't interrupt him too much. I'm, just, I'm using hypotheticals here. <laughs> Me or you? <laughs> But to that point is every partner that um, we work with, and Sam too, and this is, is, is it's a blessing and a curse, but every single day, and uh, my team who's here is, you know, one of the guys here that works for me, they sent, they, anyway, they were so upset why, you know, they liked working for me, and one of his quotes was, because perfection is not good enough. And, um, this is here, he said that. That. Um, but the point is, is, every single solitary day, whether it's me or Sam or Philippe or Jose, every single day we say to ourselves, this isn't good enough. How can we make it better? How can we make it different, like liquid olives or a lamp upside down or getting database or understanding your customer and not resting on your loyals and not becoming a, you know, I don't want to say a Westerner or something, but people got lazy. They just, they, they relied on design and they relied on certain things and that's, I don't, we don't do that. So every, and he, he is, he has, we have this other guy, he's a you know, computer, he calls him laser in our, um, in our, our company, but um, he comes in and he analyzes everything. Oh, Teresa, blah, 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 blah. And I'm like, Ugh. So, I mean, there's this constant analysis of everything that we do. And so, you know, are we there yet? No, we, are, we know very well that we are not there yet, but I think we have the tenacity and the energy and the will and the passion to, to keep pushing that. And it's, certainly, it's certainly clear, I think, clear to your audience. I want to, I want to thank you again. I, I did invite Sam once, but I'll offer the invitation again, both, both to you, Teresa, and to Sam. There's a group of, of unusual young architects, many of whom are from out of the city, have offices in this city and who teach from time to time at SIRC. And it would be, I think, interesting for me and perhaps useful to you if when when you get back from the cistern across from Hagia Sophia, that, that one of these afternoons we, we uh, get in a car and cruise around the city and visit their offices. And I think that might be, if nothing else, we just uh, kill a little time and drink a little mojito. And, but we might bump into something that, that is unusual, and I think it would be great for them, and hopefully it would be interesting to you, and I, I, I would be happy to be the chauffeur. I think it would be worth, worth so your time. You have the mojito. <laughs> <laughs> Designated driver. Thank you again very much. <laughs>